Hello, it's Miss Heather from Conservatory of the Ozarks. I'm reading some notes for my hymnody uh, test. This is about Johann Frelinghausen, and it's written by hmm, I'm not sure. It's in my notebook from class, maybe by Victor E. Gaybauer. So. Johann Frelinghausen lived from 1670 to 1739. He was barely six years old at Paul Gerhardt's death in 1676. Frelinghausen's hymnody, however, marked the end of the era which Gerhardt seemed to dominate. It was an era shaped by the tension between two parties in Lutheranism, piety and orthodoxy. These two movements are often associated with different styles of worship and hymnody. Orthodoxy centering on word and sacrament in worship, pietism on private house devotions and inner piety. Life and works. Frelinghausen's life was buffeted by the hostilities between the Orthodox and pietists. Raised in a staunchly Lutheran household in Gandersheim, a small town in Braunschweig, Ronschvig, I'm not sure. Frelinghausen was introduced to pietist writings through his University of Jena roommate. He eventually transferred to Erfurt, intending to continue his studies under the pietist leaders August Hermann Franke and Je Eustace Breithaupt. This conversion to pietism distressed his parents, especially when they discovered that their son's name was included in a list actually nailed up on the local gallows of prophets, children, and pietist students who were to be excluded from Erfurt pulpits. Frelinghausen, however, followed Frank to the University of Halle, where his mentor became a faculty member. In 1695, Frelinghausen became a Franke's, oh, became Franke's personal assistant a position he held without salary until 1715, primarily running on the charitable orphanage Franca directed, or primarily running the charitable orphanage Franca directed. He was widely noted for his administrative skills and preaching abilities. In 1715, Frelinghausen married Franca's only daughter. When the father-in-law additionally became the head pastor at St. Ulrich's Church, Frelinghausen was appointed as his vicar and, after Franca's death, head pastor. Many of his sermons and theological articles were published along with two theological textbooks, all reflecting the spirit of pietism. A series of disabling strokes in later years kept him out of the pulpit, eventually causing his death in 1739. Raylinghausen's legacy, however, rests on his 44 hymns and hymnal publication, Gestri Gestrikes Gesangbuch, literally spiritually rich hymnal, a combination of two separately published collections which included over 1,500 hymns. The combined edition known as Raylinghausen's Hymnal was published posthumously in 1741 in Halle and was widely used for over a century. The new type of hymn which Halle pietists preferred seemed to breathe a different spirit than the older hymns of the Lutheran tradition. One theological faculty quickly castigated Frelinghausen's hymnal for bringing the pompous, superfi superficial, and almost licentious manner of secular songs into churches also objecting to the many hopping, jumping, dac dactylic examples in the new book. Frelinghausen's hymn style. The background for all this fairly complicated, the background for all this is fairly complicated and cannot be repeated here. Essentially, early Lutheran hymnody often centered on choral settings. These became more elaborate and artistic, often incomprehensible to average worshipers. A simpler cantonal style satisfied a desire for clearer melody now in the upper voice. The tension was between elaborate 
polyphonic choral settings and simpler music capable of being sung by the congregation. In mid-17th century, Paul Gerhardt achieved a more heartfelt tone in hymnody. In following years, hymns were increasingly hymns increasingly embraced emotional depth. Such hymns were often written to be sung in the home with keyboard accompaniment using a figured bass. This practice allowed for vocal ornamentation, elaborate realization of the bass, eventually also the artistic performance of sacred arias. The tension now was between the soloistic styles of private hymn singing and ornamented style, and the style suited for congregational worship. Frelinghausen's influential hymn, hymnal eroded the distinction between private devotion and congregational song. Style suitable for congregational singing. While we live in quite a different cultural context, we might note some, in, some instructive parallels. The current contrast between contemporary worship songs and standard hymnody still rouses among us passions similar to those noted in the 18th century. We have been unable to resolve this conflict. Perhaps it is now time to put behind us the contemporary traditional polarity and learn a different approach from the Frelinghausen era, namely that the real issue has to do with suitability for congregational singing. One notices within contemporary praise music quite a variety of styles. Some are rem reminiscent of the ornamented hymns in Frelinghausen's time, filled with micro-rhythmic moti motives and sustained notes suitable for the level for lead vocalists in a praise team, but rarely for congregational singing. Thus, one also observes a congregation, observes congregations who have become poor singers, at best trying to hum along with a praise team, because the melodies are too unpredictable and rhythmically complex. Still, other praise songs are more regular in rhythmic phrasing and melodic structure and are easily sung by the congregation. There is no space here to provide examples, but readers will probably have their own experience of these different styles. Perhaps we will do well to abandon our attempts to judge musical suitability for worship based on style and cultural identity, evaluating newer songs instead on the basis of suitability for the participation of the worshiper. Along with our usual care for biblical truth, theological clarity, musical quality, and joyful expression of faith, the phenomenal influence of Frelinghausen's hymnal leads us to reflect anew on how best to serve our worshiping assemblies. And that's the end. <laughs>